Hi, I'm Michael Crane. Thank you for joining us for this special episode of Fort Worth Forward. We're here at Ridgely Theater on Camp Boo Boulevard to have a conversation about homelessness. Homelessness is an issue that's facing every single major urban environment across the country. And I think we're doing some great things here in Fort Worth. So let's go. Good evening. Good evening, everyone. How are you tonight? I want to thank you for being here tonight for this public conversation between Councilman Crane, District 3, Camp Bay District, and all of our service providers in the city of Fort Worth and Tarrant County. It's an honor for me to be here this evening representing Camp Bay District, and I want to tell you just a brief um, synopsis of where we are tonight with this issue. So we are a six-mile corridor. We cover 325 commercial properties, and we are the advocate for those property owners and businesses that occupy. We are faced with some of the same concerns that you're faced with every day. We are working right now with private security and police to foster a program and cultivate some data to be able to have a true assessment of what the issue is and how to better deal with it. It is not an overnight solution, and it is a team effort, and it does take a village. So I want to ask you tonight to A, listen, B, ask questions, and C, be respectful. All of us are trying to work for a better community, and we're all trying to foster a better society for our future generations and the generations to come for Fort Worth. Tonight, you're going to hear from several esteemed subject matter experts who are going to talk about their work within the community, not just on this side of town, but all over Tarrant County. You're also going to hear from Councilman Michael Crane as he answers questions and talks about some of the work here in District 3. But first, before we move any further, I'd like to introduce our mayor, Maddie Parker. She means a lot to me as she services and lives in this area, and it is very true to her. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Maddie Parker. How is everybody? Good? Thank you, first of all, for such an amazing turnout for a public meeting. Um, in all candor, sometimes you'll go to a public meeting, and it's five people, and we still show up as a city of Fort Worth. You've got a variety of different members from different departments from the city, and also community partners, nonprofits, to make tonight's meeting meaningful. Um, you'll hear from experts today, but also please take the time to, to visit with folks that are in the back of the room and thank them for taking their evening here on a Monday. Um, so this is home for me. My husband and I and our children live in Ridgely North. We actually walk past here often to go to dinner or go shopping in this area. And so many of you that live in this part of the community or if you live across Fort Worth, um, homelessness is something that's on the forefront of our minds every single day. And you have seen an uptick, especially during COVID and after COVID. But what you'll hear about tonight are the efforts the city of Fort Worth has taking on to really lead um, to be different and as a large growing city. Fort Worth is the fastest growing city in the entire country. And with that comes an immense amount of responsibility. And like most large cities in the country, homelessness is probably one of the top issues we grapple with every single day. Um, but to give you context on why we're here tonight, there's a way to do this um, that really puts human dignity at the forefront, but also understands that you need the right kind of wraparound services to serve people that are in crisis. Because to be honest, if someone is homeless, they are in crisis. Oftentimes, they have many co-occurring issues, substance abuse, drug abuse, mental health. Um, I could go on. So that's number one for me, is remembering that there's a human being at the center of this that we're trying to help. Number two is to preserve neighborhoods. Um, each of you are sitting here because you're concerned. You wouldn't have taken time on a Monday evening in 110 degree heat if you weren't. And so that's why I think tonight's set up. Um, congratulations to Michael Crane and his entire staff for putting this on. Um, because I think that the conversation you'll hear from today will both be informative and something you'll come back with and feel uplifted in a lot of different ways. You won't have all your questions answered, and by no means is the city perfect. We're learning together, and we can't do this alone just as a city, as a community. Um, there's a few things we've done right that I think are notable. The first would be investment in affordable housing and uh, housing for homeless. $26 million in this last cycle focused on this issue, partnering with our nonprofit partners. And number two, what does affordable housing look like in the fastest growing city in the country to prevent homelessness in general? Last summer, you may have heard us talk about the crisis we had with children and family homelessness in our community. And it was impactful to me. I've seen it firsthand. Um, but when I visited Salvation Army and I saw a mom trying to put a baby down for a nap at 2 o'clock in the afternoon 
in the middle of a homeless shelter, um, it'll break your heart, right? First of all, I couldn't get my little one down at two without a sound machine and all the perfect environment. Um, And here was this sweet mom trying to make the best for she and her son. So in Fort Worth, we can be better and learn together. Um, So last thing I'll just say is thank you for making Fort Worth such a great place to live and work and play. We're incredibly blessed. Um, I get to travel on behalf of the city of Fort Worth across this country and visit with other mayors. And I joked last week at another event that I go back to DFU Airport and practically kiss the American Airlines plane I'm on because our city is different. And while we have our fair share of problems and we are imperfect, the way you solve these things is really working together as a community. And we're really blessed to have community members that take this much time out of your day to talk about some of these toughest issues. I think Michael, um, Councilmember Crane is also gonna introduce this topic. Um, many of you are from across the city of Fort Worth, um, but I have to at least acknowledge the Camp Bowie District and Lydia and her board and team for really helping um, put this forward tonight. And, and obviously the city staff that made this possible. Councilmember Crane and I had a conversation about a month ago Um, and some concerns I'd have from neighbors and friends that live in this community, that see it firsthand as business owners um, and as homeowners, and that wanted to hear this conversation here in District 3. Um, So so thank to to Michael Crane, thanks to Michael Crane and his team for really putting this forward and taking it head on. These are hard issues, and he didn't have to do this, and he decided it was important enough to really host it citywide. So many of you may be from across the city of Fort Worth, and for that we're incredibly grateful. I'll stop talking. I'm going to turn it over, I think, back to Lydia, who's going to introduce Michael. Michael didn't want me to introduce him for some reason. I don't know why. Smart man. Just joking. Lydia, come on out. Thank you all very much for being here. All right. So I just want to go over a few house rules tonight. First of all, it is warm in here. There is water on the third level of the um, auditorium. So please help yourself to that. The second thing, in just a minute, we're going to have our speakers come out, and and the program is going to be moderated by Councilman Crane. At that time, he's going to allow each of our speakers to talk a little bit about the services they provide and what they're doing to deal with some of these concerns here and issues that we're facing in our community. When you came in, you should have signed in, I hope, and grabbed an index card. That is how we are taking questions tonight, to be respectful in the interest of time so that we're able to not repeat the same question over and over, but get to as many questions on as many different subject matters as possible. So if you did not get an index card, we will have somebody bring those around in just a few minutes, and we ask and urge you to write your questions. We're not going to just open the mic up and take questions. We're going to take the questions and deliver them up here to the to the participants. So that's the first thing. The next thing I get to do tonight is introduce my friend, Councilman Michael Crane. I want to really applaud his effort for pulling this together, pulling me into this and saying, let's do this, because we are here to really make sure that we're building a better community. So I'm not going to say much more than that. Without anything else, here's Councilman Michael Crane. Thanks. Thank you. Can you? Thanks, y'all. Can you hear me? Hey, welcome tonight. Thanks for spending the time to come out here. I want to thank Lydia and the Camp Bowie District for what is really a culmination of months and months and maybe years of us having conversations about this, but saying we got to pull the community together and pull the nonprofits together and all the parts of the government and everybody else that are looking at this issue and what are we going to do to help resolve it and maybe solve it. I'll tell you right now, we're not going to solve it tonight. This is a, a crisis that's been happening for a long period of time. But it really was um, after many conversations with with the Camp Bowie District and the board members uh, and other folks and and community members that I know that said, we don't want to turn into the next San Francisco or Austin or all these other cities that we see where there's a homeless population that is rampant. So what are we doing to really be humane about it, but at the same time make sure that we are doing what we can to keep uh, the, the city clean and safe as we've said it is. So that's really the impetus for tonight, and I'm looking forward to the conversation I'm having. And I'll tell you this, I have a couple of nonprofits on this, this stage. There could be a myriad of, of nonprofits up here doing it, because there are a lot of people here and friends here doing great work. Um, but I chose to that we have, uh, that we, we're really, uh, that can be representative of the, the network uh, that's out there together. Um, and I know there are some questions and things that we'll ask as part of that, but I'm, I'm cognizant of that, that there are lots of people playing lots of roles here. And so, um, again, thank you. And now I'll, I'll welcome the panel. We'll just get started. I've got uh, Forward Police, representing the Forward Police Department, Chief uh, Aldridge is here. Y'all just come on out. Uh, give a hand, too, as we're going. 
Lauren King with the Tarrant County Homeless Coalition, Tara Perez, the Directions Home Program, the Fort Worth Fire Department, Chief Davis is here, and Debbie Rabelais with the Presbyterian Night Shelter. Thank y'all. I also would be remiss if I didn't point out, uh, we've got Fernando Costa I know here from the city. I've got my colleagues, Carlos Flores and Charles Lowersdorf that are here uh, on the council. Uh, my wife is here. Uh, thank you for being here tonight. When we first met, my wife and I, uh, I know Bruce Frankel's here somewhere. She was getting up on Saturdays and going to wash clothes at the homeless shelter, uh, at the DRC. So this is how long this 23 years that she's put up with me, or 25, uh, that she's put up with me, that this has been an issue that I've at least, it's been on my radar thinking about how do we do, what, how do we service them from the basic just getting their, wa their clothes washed to then uh, getting a job and having a place to go. So um, with that, I'll start this. I, one of the big things I wanted to do as we had this discussion was talk about myths. Myths of homeless, myths, myths of uh, who, who are homeless, what they are, and so I want to, from y'all's perspective, and we'll just start with you, Chief Aldridge, let's bust some myths to start off with. Sure. Uh, before I get started, can, it, can everybody hear me? Yeah. Okay. So I would like to acknowledge the MPOs, the yes. sergeants, Commander Ricks, the HOPE team that's in the back. They're the ones that are out there doing this work. Um, yes, please. I'll be the first one to say, if you do not know your MPO, get to know your MPO. Um, they are one of the greatest resources we have in the city to help solve some of the problems that are going on. So I'll cover a couple of myths whenever it comes to homeless. Uh, you know, the myth is all panhandlers are homeless. Well, that's incorrect. Not all panhandlers are homeless and not all homeless are panhandlers. Uh, you know, we, we can say that time and time again. We have seen people that have gotten out of vehicles going to high profit intersections where they can go, they can make a little bit of money, get back in their cars and take off. Um, I want that myth kind of dispelled because everybody sees the panhandlers out there and go, oh my God, we got this epidemic of homeless people. Well, it's, it's not that. Uh, we are a very giving city. Uh, we're very fortunate. The citizens are phenomenal. Um, but unfortunately, I don't think they understand the risk associated with just giving somebody money out of their car at an intersection. There are much better organizations. You met some of them in the back whenever you got here. Um, those are a much worthy, more worthy cause than to put yourself in a precarious situation giving money to the homeless. One of the other things is that homeless individuals commit most violent crime. That's absolutely false. Now, it's not a hardcore rule that they don't commit any violent crime, but there is a very small majority of the homeless individuals that commit violent crime. They are looking to get very portable items that they, you know, to steal items from your yard, from your uh, side of your house, from your vehicle. Um, they're looking for things that they can offload pretty quickly. They're not looking to hurt people. In fact, you know, if you, if, if you get in front of somebody uh, more times than not, they don't even want to be around you. Uh, I can tell you, I, I've had time and time again, driving through the city whenever I've not been at work, um, you roll down the window, you tell them to get out of here, get away from you, I'm going to call the police, they walk off. Those are a couple of myths. There's quite a few more whenever it comes to the homeless, but in respect to everybody's time, I want to give everybody else an opportunity. Lauren? So I'll go off your panhandling. Um, and also you introduce know? yourself oh, to yes, part of your sorry. organization. Yeah. Um, I'm Lauren King. I am with, um, I'm executive director for Tarrant County Homeless Coalition. So the coalition actually works with all of the partner agencies hopefully that you know and love, many of them in the back. Um, and so we make sure we have a coordinated response as a community. Um, so all of our shelters work together, all of our outreach teams work together, all of our housing programs work together, and we are all moving toward a vision of a vibrant community where everyone has a place to call home. You don't have to define what that looks like, how they get there, but we want everyone to have a place to call home. Um, and we want it to be a vibrant community for everyone, including people experiencing homelessness and all of you all as well. I was born and raised in Fort Worth. I have a deep love for this city. so. Um, we are there and that's what we do. So one of the myths, I'll build off the pain handling myth, uh, that kind of, I think the stereotype really um, exacerbates this, uh, is that people are homeless for a long time in our community. Um, in fact, they are not. Uh, about 12 to 15% of the homeless population has experienced homelessness for more than a year. The majority of the population is homeless for less than six months. I talked about our partnerships and how much we work with nonprofits. They are all very, very committed to getting people out of homelessness as quickly as possible. They often ask the question, how can I end your homelessness tonight? Our goal is not to keep people in shelter. Our goal is not to keep people on the street. Um, our goal is to give people a place to call home. So 
just know that, um, that I know sometimes when you think about homelessness, that stereotype comes in your head of a person who's been homeless for, an experience, for a long period of time. Um, that is not the majority of people who experience homelessness in our community. Um, so, so keep that in mind that about 85 to 90 percent of people um, experience homelessness for less than a year. The other one is how you can help. So um, also talked about giving, giving things out, um, handing things out. We are a very giving city. Um, and uh, so the best way to help people is by giving them stuff. Uh, that is not the case. I would encourage you to help our nonprofits. Um, we have a lot of systems in place to help people. And if we can um, get in touch and make sure that an outreach team is seeing them, a shelter is seeing them, um, we want to move them into a place to call home. And so we can do that um, just by serving them. I will say, if you feel passionately about food or clothing, um, we have lots of people who are in housing and who are being cared for by our agencies. Um, that would love to have that fellowship and would love to have that experience with you. So um, if you want to give, I would encourage you to please give to our nonprofits um, that are existing in our city. They are wonderful. They do amazing things. Um, and figure out a way that you want to use your gifts um, to give back. Great. Tara? Okay. I think one of the myths is there's plenty of housing. And if someone's homeless, it's because they don't want that housing. Um, I just wanted to share three numbers with you. The first number is 32,000. That's how many affordable housing units that the city of Fort Worth is short, 32,000. The second number is 78%. 78% of landlords in Fort Worth don't accept rental assistance. The third number is 350. 350 is the number of homeless households that have rental assistance right now that are trying to find a place to stay. Great. What in your organization? Tell me a little bit about what you do. I'm with the City of Fort Worth in the homeless unit. Okay. Chief Davis. Good evening, Councilman. We're Jim Davis. I'm the fire chief. I'm very privileged to be the fire chief here for the last five years. And I, I, th I think the first myth, there's two that I'd like to get out tonight. One is that the fire department just goes to fires. Um, everybody thinks of the <laughs> everybody thinks of the Fort Worth Fire Department as being um, hey your fire department and that's true, but the Fort Worth Fire Department is so much more than that. Almost 75 to 80 percent of the work that we do is in support of things that create an environment where somebody needs medical assistance, be it injuries from an auto accident or a fall, be it homelessness on different areas of our town. Um, there's a lot of stuff that the Fort Worth Fire Department, all 978 members are trained to the basic emergency medical technician level and or the advanced level of being a paramedic. Work in conjunction every day with every partner agency that you spoke about, including the Fort Worth Police and MedStar. And they are good partners in the community. So I wanna get that out first. But secondly, I think the biggest myth is that um, any one agency can do this alone and any one agency can solve this problem, and it's not my problem to work on or solve. Because I just, I'm the fire chief, and I just go to fires. The fact of the matter is, we, it's a community problem, and a community problem requires a community solution. And that is why the Fort Worth Fire Department is sitting up here tonight. I'm here to thank everybody that we have a chance to work with, because one of the things that happens is we are the safety nut of the entire healthcare system, and I, I, I say that very confidently and not to offend anybody else in the healthcare environment, but at any moment, any given notice, any one of you can take your cell phone out and call 911 and have the confidence that within 10 minutes somebody's going to be standing here offering to help you. And if folks see somebody on the sidewalk, see somebody in what they feel is in a, you know, 100 plus degree temperatures and not doing well on the street, they make those calls. Fort Worth firefighters, police officers, MedStar, we all arrive together and try to solve that, solu or that problem. Those solutions require more than just let's get you in the back of an ambulance and transport you to the local emergency department because all that's doing is just moving the problem off of the street into another environment and so we are dedicated as the Fort Worth Fire Department with the support of city leadership to try to make a difference in the discussion on a day in and day out basis and that's why we're doing some of the things we're doing that's why I'm excited to be here tonight with you and my myth is Community problems take community solutions. We can't do it alone. Great. Thank you. Uh, Debbie. So I'm Debbie Rabelais. I'm with Presbyterian Night Shelter. Presbyterian Night Shelter 
has been around for 39 years. We're the largest provider of homeless services in Tarrant County. So we see about 80 to 90 percent of the folks who are homeless in a given year in Fort Worth will come through our doors, whether it's through our day shelter or one of our overnight shelters. But more than that, we, we believe that getting out of homelessness takes three things. One is shelter, the second is income, and the third is housing. And so for, for us, we have done shelter very well for a long time. The, the second is income. In 2016, we started doing some, uh, uh, we started a social enterprise that today sends out 175 full-time employees that were um, homeless or formerly homeless that um, are benefited. They have the exact same benefits I do. They are, are an employee of Presbyterian Night Shelter. The third is housing, and as Tara talked about, we are more than 32,000 units short in affordable housing in the city of Fort Worth, and so we have part of our mission is to build housing for individuals that um, have been homeless. That's Some great. Um, thank you all for being here to have this conversation. One of the things I, I, I'll just start here with you, uh, Chief Aldridge, is to talk about what you, and, and, and Chief Davis to jump in here as well, what you can and can't do as peace officers when you're working with homeless, when you get calls, and then really what people should do when they get calls. That eventually will lead to the services that can be provided, but what, what can you, can't you do as a peace officer? Sure, so what I'd first like to start off with is if there's a problem, you see somebody, you see somebody panhandling, you have to call us. If you do not call us, we do not know that problem exists, right? I, the way that we basically send our resources around the city is whenever we get those phone calls. And even if, even if it's a reoccurring problem, it's a really, it's a problematic issue, and you see that person there time and time again, that's where the MPOs come in. Um, specifically in West Division, but I know in other divisions, they run details for panhandling speci specifically. They run one or two details a month, and they include our Code Blue members, which are volunteers that help out the police department, and they try and attack this panhandling issue. So one of the challenges that we have whenever you're dealing with uh, the panhandlers, whenever you call us, sometimes they're on private property. So if they're on private property and the owner allows them to be on that property to panhandle, there is really very limited that we can do. Okay, we can encourage them to leave, we can educate the owner, and we do that time and time again. But a lot of the onus is on that, that property owner to let us know they do not want that behavior there and they want this individual gone. So that's one of our biggest challenges, you know, out there. And another thing is, just because the individual's walking down the street, even if they are holding a sign, okay, they can hold a sign, they can walk down the street, it's absolutely legal to do so, but we do have an aggressive panhandling ordinance. And so that ordinance is pretty well laid out that they cannot stand in front of you, they cannot block your path, they're not supposed to panhandle at intersections, they're not supposed to walk out in traffic. Uh, again, you guys are the ones that live in the community. You know where the problems are. Our officers do a really, really good job at trying to address most of the problems, but as you know, we prioritize most of our calls. And so you may call today and say, this panhandler's here, and you get really frustrated because it may take the officers a little bit of time to get there. Well, we have different levels of priorities of those calls. If somebody's being injured, it's higher priority than a panhandler. And so in those priorities, sometimes it does take an officer to get there a little bit longer. Again, I'm gonna, man, I'm gonna beat a dead horse, which is our MPOs are a really good resource to tell us where these problems are occurring. I've heard from some of the community members just tonight, you know, it's, it goes well beyond the panhandling. You, it's the prostitution, it's the drug dealing. And you know what, we see those things across the city. So if you think the issue is specifically in West Division, please don't think that. You know, 10 years ago, you probably could have said the majority of our homeless population, and even probably a lot of the panhandling issues were around the Lancaster Corridor. Well, that's not the case. We got issues in far north, we got issues in far east, we got issues in northwest, we got issues out west, down south. It's across the city. It is not just one place. And so our officers do a really good job that they educate the individuals. One of the things that we want, we don't want to criminalize a homeless person. 
We, well, what we want to do is try and get them help. We want to try and get them connected to these resources. These are great partners. I've dealt with every one of them. One of the best ways to get out of the homeless issue is permanent supportive housing. If we have the housing and we have the beds, we can get them off the streets. So one thing that Tarrant County did is they created a diversion center. And a diversion center is an ability for us to take some of the home homeless individuals to an area that has these services all concentrated into one. And so they triage the individual, they try and help them either A, get jobs, help them get services, and they actually track them for over a year. And so they keep tabs on them and they basically are trying to help them break that cycle of homelessness. So I know for us, I can't arrest my way out of this problem. I just can't. I need your help. I need all the private partner help. I need the council's help and they have been unbelievably supported every time that we've asked for their help. So from my perspective, it's more than just answering the call. It's being able to provide resources outside of our control to be able to guide these people too. Councilman, I think I'd, I'd just add to that from the, from the other side, from the medical health care perspective. Folks need to understand that as long as the, the person, the patient, is awake, they're alert, they're oriented, they're not a risk or a threat to themselves or others, they do have rights and we can't force services on them in a lot of situations. We can't throw them in the back of an ambulance against their will, back of a police cruiser and force them into some service that they're not willing to accept. So with the exception of isolated cases, there we, we walk a fine line on making sure that we don't violate their civil rights along the way. And I think Chief Aldridge would agree with me on that. Absolutely. That's a very good point. I'm glad to bring up the MPOs. I want to say they're always my first call, the office first call to say what's happening, what's happening on the ground. They probably know this person and they probably dealt with them or if they haven't, they, they will. Uh, and one of the conversations I did have uh, with, the, with the citizen, one of my residents and a, and a friend was, well, I said, have they called when the problem happens? Have they called? Have they called and let people know? Because I have to, uh, as you know, the city has to allocate resources in one way, one way, shape or form. And the way we do that is with metrics. What are the calls? What's happening? And the answer I got was, um, no, I don't want to get them in trouble. There, is, there are some people that don't want to, they feel like they're, they're tattling on them. And I was like, but we can't connect them with services if we don't know they exist. And I can't internally fight for resources, more NPOs in certain areas, or more whatever the gamut of resources if we don't have that log somewhere. So Chief Davis, I know there were two new positions created last year. Um, tell us about that and how they might work with the HOPE team and how that all works together and, and eventually how that sort of saves money. So several years ago, the police were really, you know, they were novel at the idea of standing up a team to go out and um, work on the community problems that they were seeing. Um, we, fire department, we approached the police department about trying to do it as a multidisciplinary collaborative team where the fire side is using their healthcare EMS knowledge to provide a medical assessment, a medical approach because we were seeing an increase in call volume related to 911 needs in the homeless population. So there was a trial project that was started, um, data was collected, uh, there were wins, there were challenges, there was relationships developed, and with council's blessing and the city manager's office uh, um, really pushing us to think outside the box, provide data that demonstrates that there's some value to the program, it was fully funded with two additional full-time positions um, in this past budget year by, by council and, and the city leadership. So there, you know, the, the, the police are, are providing um, their resources towards their end of the program. Fire is now trying to work collaboratively with JPS, who has a presence, all the other different teams to make sure that when folks are ready and willing to accept help or in need of some type of help that they didn't even understand um, that, that there's a multidisciplinary approach to it. So that's how we're trying to make a difference. That's great. So what I hear too from the public safety perspective, someone's aggressive, et cetera, there are things that we can do yes. and take them place at a diversion center or if they're being aggressive and they've broken a law, yes. so we, can, we can deal with them that way. If it's a medical issue, then we'll deal with it through the, the fire department, EMS, et cetera. Um, but we eventually connect them with services, and that's the idea. And so, Lauren, I want to jump to you. I mean, a statistic that's out there is 60% of Americans are one paycheck away from being homeless. 
And I, I think if people were probably more honest with themselves and looked at their own budget and they lost their job tomorrow, would they be able to continue to do the things or live the way they're living? The answer is no, but would they be able to stay in their house and do whatever? So with that in mind, we get some folks out there and I think there's a lot of misnomers of who comes in, mm -hmm. but let's talk about the services that are being provided because you have a coalition of members mm -hmm. that are part of the Tarrant County Homeless Coalition. Absolutely. So um, as you mentioned, uh, right now, I'll give you an example. Um, over the past year, we've seen a huge influx of homeless families. Um, we typically had not seen that. Families were a very small portion of our population historically. Um, and it's, it's people who have fallen off the edge. Like they had, um, they were potentially living with someone else, um, with another person who was on the edge and can't afford rent. Um, I think Fort Worth has also made the turn of we used to be a very affordable place to live and not so much anymore. So um, families who are coming to us are telling us, my landlord raised my rent by three to $500 a month. And even if I make $15 an hour, I, can't, uh, I cannot absorb that into my budget. Um, and so it's not even evictions necessarily that are getting us, although that, that does play a, somewhat of a factor. Um, so that's just an example of, you know, whenever people think about who's falling into homelessness, for families, often it is a math problem. The numbers do not add up to pay for housing, childcare, food, medications, transportation, all the things. Um, as far as what we do, so the Homeless Coalition, we are a true coalition. Um, we have about 40 member agencies who go through a vetting process and actually provide services to people experiencing homelessness. Um, they are all aligned with the mission of everyone having a place to call home. Um, our partners are amazing. Um, I would say you would think in homeless services that all the shelters would be competing against each other, all the outreach teams would be competing against each other. Um, that is not the case. Um, they are very, very collaborative. Often if we have to make a plan around some kind of emerging issue, all of them are going to be at the table um, to talk about what's my role in this. They're always willing to take on new projects um, and think about uh, how we can address something. Um, as the Homeless Coalition, we are one of the things, um, you may be wondering, how do you know what someone experiencing homelessness, if they're just going from place to place, how do you know what they're getting? So just so you know, our community has a centralized database. Everyone enters into the same one, so you can see where people have been, what they've, who, the, who has served them, that sort of thing. Um, and so at the Homeless Coalition, that really helps us see at the 30,000 foot level, what are some trends happening? Our partners are in the trenches, they're doing the work, um, but we're trying to watch those trends to say, back in April of 21, hey, our family shelters are at capacity, what's about to happen? Because over the summer, people lose their primary mode of childcare, public school, um, and family homelessness generally, historically has gone up. And so we were really, really concerned when we hadn't even hit those summer months. And so then started working with our, our shelters um, and outreach teams to really understand what kind of response do we need? Do we need more resources? What's this gonna look like? How are we gonna manage this? How are we gonna pay for this? Um, because that's, that's a constant question, right? Um, so that's a lot of what we do. Um, often we'll, people uh, who want to start nonprofits will come to us and say, what should I do? And we're able to talk about trends um, and how they can help, what, what, that, uh, what that would look like. Um, but overall, I would say we, we coordinate the response and really honestly in the homeless system, I would say we've broken those silos down. Um, we really do work across disciplines uh, and we all, I mean, I would say above all, our partners are very, very committed to um, everyone having a place to call home and really, um, uh, I would say I hope to work myself out of a job at some point. Um, I would love to say that where um, we no longer have to address this issue. Perhaps there's another social issue that needs to be addressed. Um, but I think, you know, they very much are also uh, not just in the business to say we're going to keep on carrying on and building new things just to perpetuate the issue, but really wanting to solve the issue and address um, both the issue and um, also with the person who is in need at the time, so. Well, to point out to your Tarrant County Homeless Coalition, but you're not a government entity, you're a nonprofit. I yes, want you to be I appreciate that. that. Yes. <laughs> you get government funding, but you're a nonprofit. That is true, yes. So we, uh, we are a nonprofit. Um, when we started 30 years ago, we were a true coalition, our partners coming together. Um, we've had staff for about 12 years now, but yes, we are a nonprofit. <laughs> um, we do function as such, and then um, also with Tarrant County name, we actually serve Tarrant and Parker counties. Um, and so we have two counties that we serve. Homelessness looks very different in Parker County. So we work with them um, specifically on how to address homelessness there. Um, so yeah, appreciate that because that's something that people often wonder, does the county give you all your money? Um, no, they do not. We uh, get from a lot of different sources, um, but we are, we are a nonprofit um, here to serve the whole community. Yeah. 
and jump into Press Free Night Shelter, another nonprofit. I think, Lauren, you said something about minimum wage um, and just jumping to kind of some of the things y'all do uh, at, at Press Free Night Shelter. But minimum wage is at 725, like true minimum wage right now. Mm -hmm. And you, but then you use the number $15. But I think if someone was actually making minimum wage, they would have to work 141 hours a week to afford a small, modest apartment in Fort Worth. Is That's that right? correct. Acor according to the National Low Income Housing uh, Coalition, yeah. who, who looks at specific metro areas and for Fort Worth, uh, they say you have for a one bedroom apartment you to, to not be cost burdened, which would be about 30% of, of your income right. towards housing. You need to make twenty about twenty eight dollars an hour. I'm sorry, that's for a two bedroom. Twenty eight dollars an hour. Twenty four dollars an hour for a one bedroom. One bedroom. So we know most of our families are not at jobs that they're going to make twenty four to twenty eight dollars an hour, which means they have to work up if they're at minimum wage one hundred and forty one hours a week or multiple jobs. Yeah. But y'all are doing something there. Let's talk about Upspire that sure. you're doing as part of that, which really gets in that idea. You talk about shelter income and then mm -hmm. housing as part of that. So this is taking people and put, getting them jobs in places where we need jobs. Why don't you tell people about Upspire and what you're doing there? So Upspire, it, it's a social enterprise, which means it's, it's a for-profit organization that is run under or for benefit of a nonprofit. So we, Last year, paid out $2.26 million in, in wages to folks who are either um, homeless or formerly homeless. And I say that because they can, they can start with us as someone who is homeless, but then as they, as they um, earn income, they get, they get a, a place of their own. They can still they can still be employed with us. So, so they um, w those barriers that uh, that are get in the way of housing, or or get in the way of employment. We help them get their IDs. We help them with uh, transportation to and from work to make sure that they that they are able to do that. And we've had great partnerships. We bid for contracts just like any other business would, but we have. Um, several contracts with the city so you may see our upspire trucks we do litter pickup in 10 different areas across the city we we provide through waste management if any person that you see on the back of a waste management truck is an upspire employee so we we have about 40 folks that go out for that uh, on those jobs every day as well and um, as I mentioned earlier, about 175 uh, people are, are employed every day. That's great. I know we use it in Las Vegas, use Upspire in Las Vegas, the Las Vegas Trail mm -hmm. to pick up trash and do some other things there, and these jobs that are somewhat hard to fill. So I appreciate what y'all are, are doing there. Tara, what, tell us about the Directions Home Program, what that, how, how that works, and what we're doing, and how we kind of coordinate all together. Okay. So Directions Home is the, um, the two-person homelessness unit at the city of Fort Worth. And so the city has many responses to those experiencing homelessness and those affected by homelessness. I mean, you've heard tonight from Chief Aldridge, Chief Davis, their concerns for basic health and safety. And the city also provides federal funds for our emergency shelters to take care of people's immediate needs. And there's also responses to camps and camp cleanups, um, especially since the state legislature passed a camping ban two years ago. So those are some short-term responses to assist those experiencing homelessness and the neighborhoods. But there has to be a long-term solution. If not, then what we're doing is just shifting the problem around. One neighborhood calls and says, hey, there's lots of camps over here. Then people leave. Then the next week, it's another neighborhood association or another business group. And so there has to be a long-term solution. And what we found is the only thing that can end someone's homelessness is housing. And so at the city, we have put a lot of emphasis on being focused on housing is the answer. 
In the past couple of years, the city has been able to allocate a lot of federal COVID funds, um, about $30 million, largely federal, to build housing. And this housing is for different kinds of folks. It's for folks who are disabled and have been homeless a while, or for families. And what this does is, this is the solution to someone's homelessness. Now, some folks, when they go into housing, they need some, something else. They need services, right? So it's not how, what we call housing first, not housing only. And so our partners provide those services to help people stay housed, whether that's connecting with employment or connecting with health care or whatever their goals are. But that housing is essential because sometimes uh, my office receives a lot of calls about people experiencing homelessness in camps. And I think sometimes there's an expectation when we say like, okay, we'll send out outreach uh, or we'll send out the hope team that that person will disappear. And that's not what happens. You know, we do have great services in our community. We are offering them to people experiencing homelessness. A lot of folks are accepting those services, but what we don't have at our fingertips is housing. And so that's why the city has been very focused on keeping that as our long-term goal. And I also want to point out, it's not just the city funding it, but we partner with other organizations. Part. I know there's a ton of them out there that look at housing and their mixed income, et right. cetera, right? I don't know if you want to, y'all, anybody have a comment about that. I don't, I don't want the misnomer that it's only city putting funding because there are private developers that do this. Right, there are private developers. There are um, local philanthropic foundations. Um, locally, they stepped up and created a pool of $5 million to match dollar for dollar what the city was doing. And there's also county funds and then a lot of federal funds due to COVID. So it's definitely not just the city. We're able to leverage our city funds a lot. Great. Well, I'm cogn I think there are questions out there. Lydia, throw it to you. I want to cognizant that there are questions we asked. Anybody? So you got it? Okay. Okay, so our first question from the audience is, what is the best way to donate goods, new clothes, blankets, et cetera, and which goods are most needed? What, what was, was the, the, what was the last part? Which goods are and which needed? goods are most needed? Yeah. So I can talk about that. Um, it depends on the season, honestly. Um, so right now, um, I would say water, bug spray, sunscreen, chapstick, uh, band-aids um, are all very much in need from both our outreach teams and also our um, shelters. So um, they all have ongoing lists. I will say our shelters have also been at capacity for a while, Presbyterian Night Shelter. Uh, one thing the Homeless Coalition does is we check in with everybody to see what they need. Are we, do we still have our pulse? So when people ask this question, we can tell them. Um, sheets are in need, towels are in need. As our shelters are full, they are blowing through these things. And so if you have those, um, definitely bring them. Um, another thing to do is, um, we mentioned housing, talk housing, housing, housing. Um, is do welcome home basket. So if you think about when you moved into your first place, from wherever, from mom, dad's house, from wherever that may have been, um, you needed everything to start. Paper towels, a shower curtain, plates, silverware, a bath mat. Um, so we try to get people who are moving off the street and don't have anything, um, a fresh start to life and a welcome home basket. Um, that's a great service activity for church groups, civic groups, um, assign a group brooms, assign a group paper towels, and that's a great way to give back as well. One, one of the things I'll, I'll say, let's talk about this for a second, because um, we've talked about housing a lot, and, and that will get to the root of it, but permanent supportive housing. <coughs> what is that, and why is that important in the system that we are? Because there is, you know, something we haven't really said is, there's a population of, that are homeless that just want to live off the grid. They never, it's, they never want to go into housing. It's, it's a very small population, I think. Um, and we kind of threw out the number, I think, before to 3%. But there's another part of the population um, that just needs to uh, get through the system of sorts. Um, and they may be um, not permanently able to work, et cetera. So we've got to figure out how, what, what, what happens to them. And so we've set up permit supportive housing. So just what kind of services are available there in, in the permit supportive housing that we have been setting up? 
Do you want me to talk about this? <laughs> so permanent supportive housing is exactly what it sounds like. It is a permanent rental subsidy. Um, so it is um, generally federal funds helping pay rent for people um, long term. I will say when I say permanent, the, our average length of time there is five years to get back on their feet and get going. Um, and so it is for people who are disabled. Um, there are lots of different types of disabilities, but it is for people who have a disability and who've been homeless for more than a year. Um, so on site, uh, we can, well, on site, it depends actually. The, so there's permanent supportive housing actually everywhere. It's not just in one location. We actually have about 1,200 scattered sites. So they could be in all kinds of different apartments um, and you would not know how a person is paying their rent. And, and I, I think it's in, interesting to point out there is there was a philosophy at one point in time that you put all the homeless people in one area. And what happens though there is generations might grow up and they're not aspirational. But you, what you want to do is put someone that's leaving, you know, mm -hmm. someone that might be homeless or experiencing homeless trying to figure out putting them in the same place and their kids in a place where they're seeing someone else leave with a briefcase every day and going to work, et cetera, because it's aspirational for them. And we've kind of changed that. And I know there's a lot of sometimes people like, I don't want that in my backyard. But it's already existing now, mm -hmm. and it's existing in a lot. And, and again, I get people go like, well, why are all the homeless in our area? But it's, it's really not, and they're two separate mm -hmm. things, right. really. Mm -hmm. So that's also a misnomer or a myth I want to put out there. Sorry to interrupt well, you, I thought that was important. We don't though. ever just put someone in housing and say, see you later. Um, we have dedicated partners who are providing <laughs> case management and helping them do whatever it is that they need, right? So if they need to be connected with benefits, so perhaps it's a veteran who um, has been homeless for a little while and is not on VA benefits, has served their country, um, want, is you know back in housing and needing that care, um, so it could look like that. Often I get the question about are people going back to work? It kind of depends on where they are. If they have a significant disability, they may need a little bit of time to recover from that, but yes, they may have the goal to get back to work. Um, but you have to also think about, when we think about permanent supportive housing, it's people who are on disability, typically um, they're on a fixed income. Um, so if you know of anybody who is currently living off of social security, if they can find an apartment for $300 a month to rent, then good on them. I don't think that exists. Um, and so often um, these are, uh, this is part of our aging population. So people are getting older as they're experiencing homelessness. Um, so that's what permanent supportive housing is. It's housing plus services, um, and those services are based on whatever that person needs at the time. So council member, if I can add yeah, that. please. Mm -hmm. Half a million times a year in the city, between police and fire, people invite us into their homes to solve a problem, right? Because we're in the problem solving business. So when we talk about housing, it's also important to talk about safe housing. Yes. And what I'm, what I'm getting at there is that comment was made a little bit ago, I think by you, one paycheck from being homeless. There's a lot of folks that are sacrificing some of their own safety issues, smoke detectors, carbon monoxide detectors, safe sleeping conditions for their infant, food insecurity issues. So when somebody asks what can they do, my thought is dig in where your heart takes you as well, right? Because there's so many different opportunities to give where you feel you can. There's so many different people that are trying to help populations that are struggling in multiple different ways to actually prevent further homelessness. And they invite us into their homes and the police officers, firefighters, uh, EMS workers of the city, we've been, we've been trained to look for, you know, just be observational, right? Be, be emotionally aware of your environment. And we've been very fortunate to work with partners that Cook's Children's, you know, if we need a, if we need a, a pack and play for a safe sleep condition for a child, we've got them. If we need food to get somebody through the weekend to create a, uh, uh, or fix a food insecurity issue until they can be referred, we have those capabilities, but only because of the partnerships. And so I just wanted to highlight that. I appreciate that. Lydia, do you have another one? I do. What is the best point of context to help a person start looking for services and for them to get into these services? I, yeah. I think I'll start there with, um, if, if they can get to East Lancaster, True Worth Place is our day shelter and central resource center. We have about 6,000 people a year that come through the, through there, and it's the starting point. And it, it is, now that's for individuals, rather than, um, not typically families, 
but um, about 6,000 unaccompanied folks come through there, and we, we can get them a scan card, which is what they need to get into any of the shelters. We'll do an assessment to see, do they need to really spend the night in the shelter tonight, or is there a way to divert them out of, this, out of homelessness before they ever come in? And it could be something like, I have an aunt in San Antonio, and she said I could stay there, but I can't get there. Well, what if we could verify that's a safe place, you have a place to go, then we get you a bus ticket to go there, because the cost of a bus ticket is much cheaper than spending six months in shelter and in homeless services. So, so we're gonna, uh, that's gonna be the starting point. We're gonna connect them to get up to employment for, we're gonna connect them to um, get their critical documents, which most people who are homeless don't have an ID or a social security card. So to even get that job, they need some of those things. And, and so that's a really good starting place. I would say too, you can pick up a pocket mm -hmm. pal. So our table is back, <laughs> staff's raising their hand. Mm -hmm. um, so a pocket pal is a little pocket sized guide um, with all the services, mm -hmm. True Worth places in there. Um, we also have a homeless helpline um, and the number is on the pocket pal. So if someone is in need, encourage them to call the homeless helpline. We have a staff person that, um, that works the helpline and will direct them um, kind of what the best place for them to go based on their needs. That's great. Debbie, one of the things I have here, a little note, is that 1,600 people were helped out of homelessness last year. Is that through your rapid exit program? It, it's or through, do you want to talk about your rapid exit program? I, I, I'm happy to talk yeah. about our rapid exit program. <laughs> yeah. it, it is a partnership with Directions Home with the city of Fort Worth. Uh, 1,600 were, is the amount of people our agency exited out of homelessness through a variety of in, interventions. But rapid exit is is what, what can we do to, maybe someone comes in, they get a job pretty quickly, well now it costs a lot of money to get that first apartment. If rent is $1,200 a month, you have first month's rent, maybe last month's rent, double deposit because you've had an eviction before, and all of a sudden that's $4,800 just to get out. Well, you can stay in homelessness until you possibly save $4,800, or if we can help you with some of those move-in costs, you can, you can move out very quickly and not, I, I always tell our staff that humans are very adaptive and, and it's how we survive. And so when they first walk into the shelter, we serve, in our men's shelter alone, almost 400 folks. And they walk in and go, oh my, I don't wanna be here. By day 30, they are showing the next guy around. Mm -hmm. Well, I wanna get them out before that becomes so comfortable mm -hmm. that they, it loses some of the urgency. Okay. And that's what the Rapid Exit Program does. That's great. You, Lydia? Okay, so we need help removing tents and camps from behind and around specific locations. How do we deal with that? So, one, again, the MPOs. So the MPOs have a hotline to the HOPE team. And our HOPE team is a homeless outreach team. Um, they have a protocol in place. Uh, what we need to know is where those locations are. Um, any kind of intel that you can give us, if you know how many people are there, how large it is, um, because not only do we partner with the fire department, we also partner with the code department. Code will come in and help us clean up those locations as well. So really, it's, it's more about us knowing where it's at, because once we know where it's at, we can address the issue. Can we talk about my Fort Worth app for a second and address that protocol and the use of that? Sure. Uh, my Fort Worth app is another way to report. Pretty much there's a standard list of things, and one of those is camping, panhandling. Um, it's an app that's on your phone. If you don't have it, please download it. Uh, you can take pictures with the app. Um, that information gets funneled through the police department if it's a police issue. Uh, if it's a code issue, it gets funneled to the code department. That follow-up is usually done by our MPOs. Um, if it's something more urgent because it's monitored by our communication personnel, then it will get sent out as a regular call for service. 
But that is a great resource if you believe that you're tying up our 911 system or you believe the issue is not that urgent, you can use the My Fort Worth app. Who has the My FW app? How many? Whoever is not raising their hand, download it because you can report <laughs> every single issue in the city to that. Yes. And sometimes it is a lot faster than calling or calling our office, et cetera. You know, we get called about potholes all the time. There are two pothole teams that do nothing except drive around the city and fill potholes. But if you report through that app, it automatically goes into their system and they may already be in the neighborhood. And I've literally had people call the office and within a few hours, they were like, oh my God, it's already full because it was already in the, in the area. So I'm saying for everything, download it because it is outside um, homelessness and other yes. issues. You can report every single city issue through that, that app. Lydia. So I want to interject really quick. We've gotten a lot of good questions and we're not going to be able to get to all of them tonight. What I do want to advise is that we are going to put together a web page on the campbaydistrict.com website and try to address some of these from our subject matter experts. Um, if you do not follow us on Facebook, please do. I'm just going to put that out there so that you can get the notification when this goes live. Because I don't want anybody to walk away from here thinking we're not interested. But it's going to take time to cultivate through all of these questions and to give a thoughtful response to how we are dealing with this. So what is being done to help homeless with mental health problems, especially the ones that might refuse the services? Sure. Um, so we have a variety of mental health services. Uh, my friend Susan Garnett is sitting in the front row. <laughs> CEO of MHMR. Um, so we work a lot with MHMR and JPS. Um, we have a lot, um, I, I mean, I would say in general, we're, as a society, we're missing mental health services. We're, we're lacking mental health services. Um, however, for people experiencing homelessness, um, there are a lot of services available. Um, MHMR actually has a specific outreach team that will go out and specifically deal with behavioral health issues. Um, you mentioned the Diversion Center, so yes. the county opened the Diversion Center, which is for someone who, uh, actually it's not necessarily around homelessness, um, but someone who's experiencing a mental health crisis and needs a safe place to go. Um, and they shouldn't go into the jail system. Correct, they, they, it's actually to divert them from jail, yeah. so that our jail is no longer our biggest mental health provider, which is the case at the moment. Not just for people experiencing homelessness, in general, the jail is the biggest provider of mental health services. Um, as I mentioned, JPS also provides quite a bit of mental health services as well. So we actually, I don't know that I could say it's one thing. Um, however, we have a lot of integrated services. So um, for example, we talked about permanent supportive housing um, for mental health services. Um, MHMR and JPS are on site and will go visit many of those residents who are in that type of housing. Um, so mental health services look a lot of different ways. It could look like an outreach team going out. Um, it could look, look like someone being at True Worth Place um, and people accessing services there. Um, it could also look like a peer support person at um, a housing development. Um, could also uh, look like someone providing groups. So mental health services look a lot of different ways. Um, and whenever I will say, I just I, I think it's a myth um, that there are a lot of people who don't want to have a place to live and who want to remain homeless. Mm -hmm. um, our outreach teams tell us over and over and over again that if they had 100 keys, 98 would be taken. So, um, and a lot of times, you know, if someone says, no, I don't want to be housed, there could be a mental health, um, something behind that, or it could be something else. Um, so, but yeah, so mental health services, um, although I would say we need more in general um, as, as a city um, overall, um, there are lots and lots of different ways that people can access those. And I would like to add to that as well. Uh, not only with the HOPE team, the HOPE team has an uh, MHMR practitioner that is available to them and rides with them at times, but we also have a crisis intervention team, which is totally separate from our HOPE team. Uh, their whole job is to deal with uh, individuals that are involved in mental health crisis. So, and they have uh, mental health practitioners that are on their team that respond to calls with us. So we have a lot of uh, mental health resources available at our fingertips as well. And Councilmember, the fire department's been fortunate enough to actually attend the same training, crisis intervention training, that the police, and they've been invited us to that. So these paramedics, police officers, firefighters are all functioning off the same sheet of music, standing in front of. But one additional thing that I think it's really important for the lay public to know is that not every person who appears to having a mental health issue 
is truly having a mental health issue. There's two things that your brain needs to function, and that's oxygen and glucose. And if it's deficient in any one of the, either one of those, you can really have an appearance that you're having a mental health issue when in reality you're having a potential life-threatening medical issue that needs to be dealt with first and foremost. So in a lot of situations, these folks have to be medically cleared to make sure that they are physically healthy and before being deferred into some type of mental uh, health evaluation. Correct? You agree? Yes. Yeah. Now, I think yeah. one nuance that I heard in that question is if they don't want it. Did, was there a part of the question? Yes. Home, if someone is in their home and has a mental health crisis and they're not a harm to themselves or anyone else, there's nothing, the police aren't gonna bust down the door and take them to jail or to the hospital. They have the right to refuse that service. Home, if you are without a house, you, you still have the same rights. So the police are not going to, if someone is refusing service and they're not a harm to themselves or someone else, they can't drag them to the hospital and, um, and force services upon them. I think I'm correct. correct. <laughs> But, but I think at that point, we would alert other services that might be available yes. to come out and uh, assess the situation if it's not sure. something that falls within y'all's realm. And, and I also think that's a small, a very small yeah. subset of people mm -hmm. because the professionalism of the Fort Worth Police, the Fort Worth Fire Department, MedStar is an example. Working together two o'clock in the afternoon or two o'clock in the morning can generally get someone to cooperate long enough by demonstrating empathy to the fact that we're concerned for their health, their wellness, and we want to get them someplace for evaluation to at least make sure that they're in a safe spot until resources have time to intervene. That's great. I think we can do one more. Okay, great. Right. Are there any plans for the future for regular transportation to and from for mental health and substance abuse programs before and during placements into this permanent supportive housing? It's a transportation, loaded, it's a that the question. question. Transportation. So are there, any, sorry, I'll repeat the question. Are there any plans to provide transportation? Uh, so we, yes. Um, that would be a supportive services, a supportive service that our housing programs provide. Um, so that can be done in a number of different ways. Uh, it could be a bus pass. It could be um, medical Uber if needed. It could be a case manager's car. Um, so there are lots of different ways. Um, however, I would say that we we try hard to take services to people and to make services as accessible as possible for people um, because we realize transportation is a barrier and it's not something we want uh, people to face. Thanks. Well, thank you all for being here today. Let's give them a round of applause, please. I want to thank the Camp Bowie District for putting this together. Um, I also will point out over here what will be coming to the Camp Bowie District soon, might be coming around the rest of the city as, as it gets through. I know there's a little bit of guilt factor and about the panhandlers, et cetera. So this gives you an ability to make contributions to the solution uh, and say it's okay, it's okay, to, it's okay to say no, no to panhandlers. We have a whole team that's out there looking at it, and those are not necessarily as we've talked about, but that gives us a method. So I thank y'all for being here tonight. Thank you for listening. Uh, and again, we're gonna be around if you have other questions. I know Lydia has other questions too that we do it, but we appreciate y'all being here tonight and beginning this conversation. Thank you. Thank you for joining us for this special episode of Fort Worth Forward. I hope you've enjoyed the conversation we've had about homelessness, as well as understanding all the intricate parts that really lead someone to being unhoused in the city of Fort Worth. We have a lot of services, and there's a lot of things being done here in the city, but a lot more work to do. I hope you're out there and you wanna be part of the solution. We'd love to have you. Again, thank you for watching this episode.